little look at uh, our friend Tobit. And then we will uh, take a look at the uh, apocryphon that is most suitable to International Women's Day. Because <laughs> it has virtually nothing good to say about women. <laughs> Yes. And a lot of really nasty things. Ooh, <coughs> you got something bad to say about somebody? Come sit by me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we did most of this. Um, you can see what the Book of Tobit is. It's, it's a nice book. Like and it's intended to be a nice book. It's about people living the way that a good Jew would want them to live, that the family virtues are there. Um, the first appearance of kind of angels and demons who are obviously now systematized, they have names, and there's a big literature and a big body of lore behind them. Um, that theme, by the way, of Asmodeus, the demon who uh, bumps off husbands on the wedding night is a theme that runs through uh, almost all literatures and of course uh, you know it, it runs into modern literature as well we have the uh, you know the fatal attraction kind of thing and all but uh, it appears everywhere um, and you know psychologists play all kinds of games with it about uh, you know fear of uh, fear of marriage fear of sex and all of that but uh, for some reason it crosses all the cultural lines and it's prominent in uh, Jewish literature not only in the Bible but after the Bible well into the Middle Ages. Uh, Asmodeus uh, had quite a following later on <laughs> it keeps reappearing. Um, what else about that? Everyone notices the dog and everyone takes a guess of why the dog is featured. <laughs> the dog is there at the beginning, the dog is there at the end in general, in the Bible, dog is not a kindly word. Um, pet dogs were rare. Uh, among Greeks, they were not rare. But uh, among Hebrews, they were rare. Dogs were generally, uh, you know, scavengers and uh, kind of hangers-on in towns and camps and things like that. Um, so it's quite unusual to find this, you know, very uh, sort of a companionable dog. Um, <coughs> some uh, rabbis have thought that the dog was another angel or a spiritual being, but there's no real reason to think that. The And six one, the young man went out and the angel went with him and the dog came out with him and went along with them. So the author certainly, you know, attached some kind of importance to this. We have no idea what. Um, later Judaism uh, has shown great appreciation of this prayer um, in uh, eight four the uh, wedding night prayer. Blessed are you, O God, of our ancestors, and blessed is your name in all generations forever, that the heavens and the whole creation bless you forever. You made Adam, and for him you made his wife Eve as a helper and support. Now this again is a very kind of egalitarian view of uh, husband and wife. From the two of them the human race has sprung. You said it is not good that the man should be alone. Let us make a helper for him like himself. I now am taking this kinswoman of mine, not because of lust, but with sincerity. Grant that she and I may find mercy, and that we may grow old together. Um, and they both cried, said, Amen, Amen. That uh, has been commonly used, I'm sure it still is, in synagogue services uh, for anniversaries and for weddings. And it's an uh, interesting distinction, not because of lust, but with sincerity, kind of wholehearted love, presumably. And bear that in mind when you're looking at the next <laughs> mm.
Then they uh, remember they got the fish, and the, uh, we're going to use fish entrails to cure the blindness of old Tobias. In uh, 11, 9, 10, 10. Tobias went up to him with the gall of the fish in his hand, and holding him firmly, he blew into his eyes, saying, Take courage, Father. With this he applied the medication on his eyes, and it made them smart. Next, with both his hands, he peeled off the white films from the corners of his eyes. Then Tobit saw his son and threw his arms around him, and he wept and said to him, I see you, my son, the light of my eyes. Now again, it's a, it's a feel-good book. Um, then finally in 12, the companion identifies himself, 1215, I am Raphael, one of the seven angels who stand ready and enter before the glory of the Lord. So once again, we have this kind of a royal court scenario for God in heaven, and uh, his primary courtiers are these seven angels. I, I have a question. Yeah. It's written here that it's wisdom. What kind of wisdom in this book you could what kind of wisdom in, in this book? Yes, in Job, because it's written here in a handout what you gave us. That it's wisdom, and I would like to know what... The wisdom essence, is ba essence. basically moral wisdom, you know, behaving yourself as a, a son should with regard to his father and all this is the way to have a good life. Um, an awful lot of, well, but we'll see more about wisdom in the next thing we take. But a lot of what they meant by wisdom was, uh, how shall we put it? Uh, good sense? Yeah, yeah, good sense, knowing how to get along, to uh, um, function well in your family, in your society, and so on. So, yeah, kind of commonsensical. Uh, Practical. Yeah. Not being brilliant. Not Did being brilliant, yeah. no. no. Which if we think of wisdom as somebody who's really smart. Yes. He's got a lot of wisdom. Yes. And in the next book, you'll see a kind of borderline between that, talking that way, but the wisdom is actually delivered is more of this kind of commonsensical sort of wisdom. And we're reading from the book of Tobit right now? Yes. T-O-B-I-T. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Now, I mentioned before that... Uh, this array of angels uh, corresponds to an array of demons, and uh, that pretty clearly derives from Zoroastrianism, where you have kind of the, the army of the good god and the army of the evil uh, ruler warring against one another. It says the seven angels. Do we have the name of all seven of them? Yeah, we um, yeah. There's a there's a book, uh, a medieval book, called the uh, Celestial Hierarchy, and that's a, that's a treatise on angels, and it's so uh, thorough and detailed. You think you know, actually, he had uh, met a lot of angels, <laughs> but that's the source for the uh, the Catholic Church of all the angel lore. Um, the same, and, and curiously, it was written by a guy named Dionysius, and Dionysius was thought to be the first convert of St. Paul at the Areopagus in Athens. Hmm. He's not. He's a Syrian from much later. But that was what gave him great prestige. So this was kind of, you know, one step over from Paul for getting all this information about angels. Um, so yeah, they're named, and not just, uh, also the Book of Enoch has a lot of it also. And it narrates the war between the good angels and the bad angels, the fall of the bad angel. All those things that, you know, we kind of hear and don't know where it came from. You know, the bad angels fell, why did they fall, and mm. who were they, and so on. Uh, that's all from the Book of Enoch. And uh, <coughs> Pseudo-Dionysius, they call him Pseudo-Dionysius now. Uh, picked up that and a lot of other things. And, and that's in the Catholic Bible? The book, uh, what? Uh, Enoch. 
Book of Enoch. Book of Enoch. No, the Book of Enoch is an apocrypha and a pseudopigrapha. Oh, okay. Enoch was, uh, you know, back in the uh, before Noah. So oh, the okay. idea of his writing a treatise at that time is a, a little far fetched. <laughs> <clears throat> Celestial hierarchy. Celestial hierarchies. Uh, he also wrote another thing called the uh, the mystical theology, Theologia Mystica, and that uh, really maps out, you know, the basic design of mysticism that you find in all the great Christian mystics, I mean Saint Teresa, Saint John of the Cross. And uh, again, this had great authority because it was associated with St. Paul falsely. The, uh, one of the kind of mystical classics in the English language is uh, uh, a book called Dennis Hid Divinity, uh, which sounds like somebody named Dennis Hid something called <laughs> Divinity. But Hid means hidden, actually. And Dennis is Dionysius. Hidden is mystical, and divinity is theology. So it's that book rendered into a medieval English, and that had a tremendous influence on the English mystics. So in chapter fourteen, Tobit died in peace when he was one hundred twelve years old, and was buried with great honor in Nineveh. Um, we're reminded here, too, that uh, these people seem to be doing pretty well um, in, the, uh, in, in Assyria, in the Assyria, under the Assyrian monarchy. Um, and undoubtedly some did, but uh, they were scattered in the Assyrian monarchy, not like uh, the Babylonian captivity where they maintained their communities and uh, um, often achieved uh, prosperity. This, of course, is written long, long after the Assyrian. Um, he was 62 years old when he lost his eyesight, and after regaining it, he lived in prosperity, giving alms and continually blessing God and acknowledging God's majesty. When he was about to die, he called his son Tobias and the seven sons of Tobias, <laughs> once again the seven, uh, and gave this command. My son, take your children and hurry off to Media. Media was, would become part of Persia later. So this is, uh, again, written long afterward, and knowing that the Persian captivity was the one that was favorable to them. Um, for I believe the word of God that Nahum spoke about Nineveh, that all these things will take place and overtake Assyria and Nineveh. Indeed, everything that was spoken by the prophets of Israel, whom God sent, will occur. Now, of course, they had occurred. This is, again, one of those prophecies that um, you know, kind of like a post-dated check. Um, very end of it, uh, 15, 14, 15. Before he died, he heard of the destruction of Nineveh. <laughs> Uh, and he saw its prisoners being led into Media, whom King Cyrus of Media had taken captive. <coughs> Tobias praised God for all he had done to the people of Nineveh and Assyria. Before he died, he rejoiced over Nineveh, and he blessed the Lord God forever and ever. Amen. Um, so again, you, you need to remind yourself that this is written long, long, long many centuries after these events, but written as though it was written before the events. Okay, any uh, any reflections on Talbot before we move on to, uh, to a very, very long book? <laughs> okay. I, I find it a nice book. You find it a nice book? Mm. It's a friendly book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next thing I want to look at is uh, will in your Bibles be headed either Sirach or Ecclesiasticus? Sirach or Ecclesiasticus. 
Um, why that name? Why both those names? First of all, this is an apocryphon, uh, but an apocryphal book that was cherished by the Christian Church, and uh, therefore it got to be called Ecclesiasticus, the Church's book, the Ecclesia, the Ecclesia book. Um, when I was a kid, um, liturgical readings were filled with things from Ecclesiasticus. They're now pretty well gone. The uh, reform of the liturgy around the time of the Vatican Council uh, removed most of those and put in different things instead. But uh, it was uh, replete with them. And uh, the author identifies himself as Jesus, the son of Eliezer, the son of Sirach. So Sirach is his grandfather. And Sirach is represented here as being a, a very, very prestigious sage. And here is his uh, grandson, um, you know, making his, uh, making his wisdom known by uh, putting it all together in this book. Um, throughout most of uh, history, no Hebrew text of uh, this book was found. And some even thought it had not been written in Hebrew, but perhaps in Greek. Uh, because there were a lot of Greek texts of it around. Then in the uh, last century, in the 20th century, pieces of it began being found. Um, there was a Geniza in Cairo. A Geniza is, a, um, it's often described as a storage place for books. Jewish tradition has great reverence for books. Really, any book. They still do. I mean, it kind of goes with being Jewish. You can't be a book hater and be Jewish. Um, and when a book was no longer really usable at all, I mean, it was falling apart, illegible, uh, they were unwilling to throw it in the garbage heap or burn it. So they, it was put in a, a kind of grave, mm. you know, a burial place for books. And this was. Um, usually a kind of cemented off vault, and the books were very reverently put in there, and they thanked God for the wisdom they had found in that book, and so on. And uh, then it would be covered over. Uh, these things were called genizas, G-E-N-I-Z-A-H. Um, archaeologists, once they discovered genizas, had a wonderful time, you can imagine. All this stuff and uh, in the Geniza that they found in Cairo, a really big Geniza, um, they found Hebrew pieces of the Hebrew text of Sirach. So there was no longer any question about whether it was written in Hebrew. It was, and we have all these little pieces of it. Then when they made the discoveries of Qumran, they found a bunch more pieces of Sirach. That was the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? That was the Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah. They were in there. and. Uh, then in a few other, uh, you know, less prestigious uh, <coughs> digs, they found other pieces, and they put them all together, and they had pretty much the whole book of Sirach. Mm -hmm. And they had the Greek to match it against, mm -hmm. so they could, you know, tell what it was, well, how, how it went together and all. So uh, now we do have a Hebrew book of Ecclesiasticus, uh, not quite complete, uh, pieces missing from it and also pieces in it that were not in the Greek text. And some of them will be noted in your Bibles probably. Um, but anyhow, that's uh, the author says he's the grandson of uh, um, Asirach and he's transmitting his wisdom. Now, this clearly comes, there are many indications, this comes from the second century of before Christ, before the Common Era. Hmm. Um, this was a time when the Jews were under the, uh, under the rule of the Greeks, the Hellenistic rule. Hmm. And uh, from the content of this book, it looks as though that was okay. 
And we, as we know from Jewish history, it was okay for a while, and then it got very un-okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, the next thing we'll be taking after this probably is the uh, is, uh, Maccabees. And Maccabees <coughs> describes the bad part of living under the Greeks, and finally the uh, conquest of the Greeks, and the uh, reestablishment of an independent Israel. Um, but before that, before one particular uh, Greek monarch came along, uh, Antiochus IV, um, life under the Greeks was sometimes very good and generally okay. The problem that aroused was uh, that Greek culture, and I mentioned this several times I think, Greek culture looked pretty good to the younger generation. You know, this is much better stuff than we've ever seen. You know, the education is better, the culture is better, these people are really up on things. And that caused uh, real culture wars within the Jewish community. They were the conservative Jews who said, keep these Greeks away with all their, you know, newfangled ideas and things like that, and their pagan literature, and, you know, great literature, and you know, the kids read it, this is good stuff. <laughs> um, and on the other hand, the uh, liberals who uh, said, you know, let's go with it. You know, our culture can be adjusted to fit their culture. We can appropriate their, uh, um, you know, their cultural achievements without destroying our own. And not surprisingly, this tended to follow age lines. Hmm. Um, the older generation, as always, the older generation tends to cling to the past. Uh, the younger generation tends to be often over-optimistic about the latest thing that came along. <laughs> um, <coughs> this led to uh, <coughs> violent uh, conflict within the Jewish community. I mean, really violent. I mean, mm -hmm. people killing one another. Uh, the Hellenizers versus the, uh, you know, the traditionalists. Um, and it led to uh, you know, not that violent, but great tension within families, within communities, and so on. Now, uh, books like Ecclesiasticus are thought to have been written to uh, kind of provide a Jewish example of a kind of literature uh, that the Greeks had a lot of. Literature about morality and about, you know, how to live one's life and so on. Um, this was saying, yeah, we already have this. Who needs the Jews? Uh, who needs the Greeks? Uh, we have this wisdom, and that's the kind of wisdom you find in Ecclesiastes. Now, this uh, is useful to us for a number of reasons. One is because uh, in that kind of wisdom literature, you asked about wisdom before, and this is again that uh, kind of common sense, you know, how to get along with people, how to live your life peacefully, wisdom. Um, in that kind, in reading that kind of wisdom, you get a very, uh, a very reliable grasp of what society is like. That's about the only way to get an idea of what society is like, you know. What are they worrying about? You know, what are the problems? What are you trying to avoid? What is family life like? What is political life like? And so on. Uh, so that, for uh, historians at least, is the main reason for uh, giving a lot of attention to things like Ecclesiastes. For uh, the Christ, I said the Christian Church made it the Church's book, even though it was not part of the uh, canon, it was still apocryphal. Um, the code of conduct in Ecclesiasticus was very popular with Christians. And uh, you'll, you'll see that that has pros and cons. So we'll go on. Yeah? What was, the, um, what was the purpose of, do you know why, Vatic, why the Vatican eliminated some of those readings? You said earlier that in our church we had readings, which I remember from before. Mm -hmm. But do you know why they eliminated so many of them? Yeah, they seemed, uh, they seemed a little extraneous. You may uh, be aware that uh, the Vatican Council put a great focus on salvation history. Salvation history, you know, 
going through the covenant of the Old Testament and moving right up into Christianity and into Jesus and the church. This doesn't fit that. This is, uh, there's one section of this book that might fit that, but uh, it doesn't fit that pattern well. Mm -hmm. And the uh, liturgical reformers of the time were greatly emphasizing um, covenant literature, <coughs> salvation history literature, that kind of continuum, a continuum that is partly imaginary. Um, <laughs> between, uh, um, you know, between the uh, Old Testament and the New, between Judaism and Christianity. And this seemed somewhat extraneous. And so it tended to be uh, greatly reduced in the liturgy and increasingly relegated to the liturgies of uh, like weekday masses. <coughs> if you look for it in a big fat missal now, um, you'll find it probably much more in weekday masses than in Sunday masses. The Sunday cycle got to be very much a salvation history cycle. That Second Vatican, you say? Oh, Second Vatican, yes. Yeah. yeah, the liturgical reform that that initiated. Okay, now uh, I think uh, this is a good idea or not, but uh, <laughs> the worst of Ecclesiasticus <laughs> is uh, the material on uh, domestic society, domestic relations. Um, the book is supposed to be addressed by a father to his son, and therefore a wise father to sons everywhere, but his own son. Uh, therefore, it's uh, of its very nature, you know, quite uh, male-centered. A father to his son, not a mother to her daughter, not a father to his daughter, or anything like that. And uh, that male-centeredness is very prominent throughout. Um, Let's take a look, a few, uh, look at a few examples of uh, what have kind of bothered people a lot about the uh, domestic wisdom here. Take a look at 3325. 3325. This has no particular order in the book. So you can go wherever you want. 3335, remember what was a household? A household was at the top of the pile, way at the top of the pile, was daddy or grandpa, as the case might be, the uh, alpha male. And uh, then it went down through uh, um, wife, male children, sons, then daughters, then slaves. And that was a household, from slaves at the bottom to papa at the top. Uh, here is something on slaves, and it's much more severe than you, you saw in the uh, slave material. In the Torah, there's an effort to kind of be decent about slaves, give them a way out, and so on. Here, 25. Father and a stick and burdens for a donkey, bread and discipline and work for a slave. So the donkey-slave parallel is quite deliberate. Set your slave to work, and you will find rest. Leave his hands idle, and he will seek liberty. Imagine. <laughs> Yoke and thong will bow, bow the neck. And for a wicked slave, there are racks and tortures. That doesn't appear anywhere in the Torah. Um, put him to work in order that he may not be idle. So busy work as well as actual sensible work. For idleness teaches much evil. Set him to work as is fitting for him, and if he does not obey, make his fetters heavy. Do not be overbearing towards anyone, and do nothing unjust. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the same paragraph. <laughs> 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 Well, apparently anyone does not include slaves. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And also, uh, he sees nothing unjust about this. This is just what you do. 
And I mean, in our own country, we have lots of people who would have said exactly the same thing. Yeah. Christian, but Christian further, people. <laughs> but it says further down, if you have but one slave, deal with him as That's a That's right. That's the next thing. That's a different situation. You have one slave, and if you have just one slave, he's not a laborer, he's a companion. <laughs> you got him for that. And he gets very different treatment and very different commentary. If you have but one slave, treat him like yourself, because you have bought him with blood. What that buying him with blood is, is conjectural. I don't know what it means. Really. If you have but one slave, treat him like a brother, for you will need him as you need your life. Wow. So this is very much more of like, you know, a caretaker. You know, a kind of somebody who uh, you rely on to take care of you. The visiting angel kind of, uh, uh, kind of slave. If you ill-treat him and he leaves you and runs away, which way will you go to seek it? So you need him. And that's the difference. It's a very different kind of slave. The slaves first, the first slaves were laborers. Keep them laboring. Don't give them a break because if you do, they'll try to get free and make trouble. Um, but then there's this other kind of slave who is uh, really your kind of a caretaker. And uh, you're not going to get out of him what you want unless you're nice to him. I mean, you're not going to you know, ask somebody to uh, come and keep you company, I'll release your fetters. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it does give you quite a glimpse into, into the society. There's a, a kind of slave you need as a companion, and there are these other slaves who are dangerous, potentially, um, whom you keep working. Okay. I, I don't know of any, uh, anything else in the uh, Bible and that is this harsh with regard to slaves. Hmm. Now, so much for slaves. Let's go on to uh, Sons, chapter 30, in the beginning. He who loves his son will whip him often. <laughs> that is the beginning of the treatment. <laughs> <laughs> you don't kind of read for a while and then run into that. That's the topic sentence. He who loves his son will whip him often, so that he may rejoice at the way he turns out. <laughs> <laughs> he who disciplines his son will profit by him, and will boast of him among acquaintances. He who teaches his son will make his enemies envious, and will glory in him among his friends. So you notice uh, there is a kind of a self-centeredness in all of this, you know. You want the kind of friend that people will envy you, the kind of son that people will envy you for having. So make him that way. What's the name of this book? <laughs> Sirach. Sirach or Ecclesiasticus. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. When the father dies, he will not seem to be dead, for he's left behind him one like himself, whom in his life he looked upon with joy, and at death without grief, he has left behind him an avenger against his enemies, and one to repay the kindness of his friends. Okay, so that's what we're aiming at, a chip off the old block. <laughs> oh gosh, look at the next Whoever spoils his son will bind up his wounds, and will suffer heartache at every cry. Oh, <laughs> an unbroken horse turns out stubborn, and an unchecked son turns out headstrong. Pamper a child, and he will terrorize you. <laughs> Play with him, and he will grieve you. <laughs> so no playing with your kids. <laughs> Put down that ball. <laughs> <laughs> Do not laugh with him, or you will have sorrow with him, and in the end you will gnash your teeth. Give him no freedom in his youth, and do not ignore his errors. Bow down his neck in his youth, 
and beat his sides while he is young. Or else he will become stubborn and disobey you, and you will have sorrow of soul from him. Discipline your son and make his yoke heavy, so that you may not be offended by his shamelessness. So once again, it's my reputation depending on how I deal with my son. Okay. Was it spare the whip and spoil the child? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, again, it's pretty extreme. The idea of corporal punishment is everywhere in the Bible. It's everywhere in all ancient literature, much modern literature. But this is pretty extreme. Um, okay, so much for sons. Um, one thing on daughters, 26. Oh, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid of what that is. Oh, what about wives? My gosh. Yeah, they're coming up. <laughs> okay, this is 26.1, I think. No, 26.10. 26.10. 26, 26, 10. And keep strict watch over a headstrong daughter. Oh. Or else when she finds liberty, she will make use of it. Be on guard against her impudent eye, and do not be surprised if she sins against you. As a thirsty traveler opens his mouth and drinks from any water near him, so she will sit in front of every tent peg and open her quiver to the arrow. So what he's worried about is quite clear. <laughs> okay, now we have a lot on wives. Let's take 26, 1 to 9, we're there already. Uh, happy is the husband of a good wife. Yay! The number of his days will be doubled. A loyal wife brings joy to her husband, and he will complete his years in peace. A good wife is a great blessing. She will be granted among the blessings of the man who fears the Lord, whether rich or poor, his heart is content. Now, once again, it's all about him. <clears throat> and at all times, his face is cheerful. Of three things, my heart is frightened. And of a fourth, I am in great fear. Slander in the city, the gathering of a mob, and false accusation, all these are worse than death. But it is heartache and sorrow when a wife is jealous of a rival, and a tongue lashing makes it known to all. A bad wife is a chafing yoke. <laughs> Taking hold of her is like grasping a scorpion. <laughs> a drunken wife arouses great anger. She cannot hide her shame. The haughty stare <coughs> betrays an unchaste wife. Her eyelids give her away. <laughs> it's like central casting. <laughs> um, that's from there, go to 13, right after the daughter. Um, back to the daughter, back to the wife. 13, uh, 26, 13. A wife's charm delights her husband and her skill puts flesh on his bones. <laughs> a silent wife is a gift from the Lord. <laughs> Dear. <laughs> and nothing is so precious as her self-discipline. A modest wife adds charm to charm, and no scales can weigh the valor, value of her chastity. Like the sun rising in the heights of the Lord, so is the beauty of a good wife in her well-ordered home. Like the shining lamp on the holy lampstand, so is a beautiful face on a stately figure, like golden pillars on silver bases, so are shapely legs and steadfast feet. <laughs> It, it sounds like he was auditioning. <laughs> oh, God. So, quiet and good looking, and you're okay. 
Uh, incidentally, I don't, don't know what your Bible is like, but 19, 20, 22 are in italics in this text. Uh, they're ones that uh, you know, were in the Greek but not in the uh, Hebrew. Ah. So let's go to 23 now. A godless wife is given as a portion to a lawless man, but a pious wife is given to the man who fears the Lord. A shameless woman constantly acts disgracefully, but a modest daughter will even be embarrassed before her husband. A headstrong wife is regarded as a dog. <laughs> this is not the dog of Tommy. <laughs> but one who has a sense of shame will fear the Lord. A wife honoring her husband will seem wise to all, but if she dishonors him in her pride, she will be known to all as ungodly. Happy is the husband of a good wife, for the number of his years will be doubled. A loud voiced and garrulous wife is like a trumpet sounding the charge. <laughs> and every person like this lives in the anarchy of war. So it doesn't sound as though all uh, conjugal relations were serene. <laughs> Uh, there's more, but uh, you get the idea. Um, <laughs> so it obviously does tell you something about the society of the time. Um, you, you could say, you know, this is an extremist. It's probably not an extremist, or it wouldn't be here. I mean, it ha would have to reflect prevailing views in order to be preserved. Was it still the one wife, or were they having most of were they having multiple wives? Uh, most of them had one wife at the time, but there were uh, there were multiple wives as well. Um, that faded away, I think largely for economic reasons. As more and more of them became city dwellers, multiple wives became unaffordable. You know, like a, an apartment for 20. <laughs> 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 Okay, now let's look at chapter one. Chapter one. Chapter one. We're still in Sirach? We're still in Sirach, yeah. Okay. We're going backwards. Mm-hmm. Now this is, uh, wisdom becomes increasingly personified and almost divinized. And you can see that here, and you'll see it in uh, the Wisdom of Solomon, which we'll take later. All wisdom is from the Lord, and with him it remains forever. The sand of the sea, the drops of rain, the days of eternity, who can count them? Um, now, verse 4. <coughs> wisdom was created before all other things. So, you know, before the creation, we had wisdom. And prudent understanding from eternity. So what you see here is uh, you're not, in the stricter sense, a divinization of wisdom, but something very like a divinization of wisdom. Um, these texts were later appropriated in Christianity for the Holy Spirit. And you can see that fits fine. I mean, the Holy Spirit is divinized, yeah. and uh, this, it's a spirit of wisdom, and you can apply all these texts. But here you do have something new coming in. And it's the idea of a, an attribute of God or a, something very closely linked to God, which is the source of all order, right order, right behavior. Um, well, you'll see it in uh, six. The root of wisdom, to whom has it been revealed? Her subtleties, who knows them? Now, notice wisdom is a she, and mm -hmm. wisdom is feminine in Hebrew and feminine in the Greek translation, and uh, all references to wisdom are to a woman, and there are passages in which uh, wisdom is personified as a woman, 
you know, a woman doing things, a woman teaching. So, you know, real contrast between the woman image we saw in the domestic setting and this divinization of, of <coughs> feminine wisdom. Um, eight, there is but one who is wise, greatly to be feared, seated upon his throne, the Lord. It is he who created her. So he created wisdom, but before the creation, the creation that we read of in Genesis. He saw her and took her measure. He poured her out upon all his works, upon all the living according to his gift. He lavished her upon those who love him. The fear of the Lord is glory and exaltation. Let's, let's skip that. Um, then 14. To fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. She is created with the faithful in the womb. She made among human beings an eternal foundation, and among their descendants she will abide faithfully. To fear the Lord is fullness of wisdom. She inebriates mortals with her fruit. She fills their whole house with desirable goods. Um, 19. She rained down knowledge and discerning comprehension. She heightened the glory of those who held her fast. Now, in 22, we move away from that entirely, it will be back, um, to uh, you know, wisdom in the sense of how to behave. 22. Unjust anger cannot be justified. 23. Those who are patient stay calm <coughs> until the right moment, and then cheerfulness comes back to them. They hold back their words until the right moment. Now, a lot of this sounds, uh, this is the wisdom that the wisdom book is about. That kind of wisdom. You know, how to behave yourself in a way that will make your life okay. Um, it should remind you of things in, in our literature. Um, you know, a lot of the kind of how to make friends and get along with people kind of literature. The uh, conflict resolution literature, which we have a lot now. Um, and that's what it's for. It's how to live in order to enjoy life and keep it peaceful. You'll find in Ecclesiasticus and in the other wisdom literature a great emphasis on how one speaks, um, the use of language, the use of communication. And there, there really is a quite elaborate uh, morality developed. So often in uh, Christian circles, you know, the bad use of speech is lying, period. But uh, in the wisdom literature, you get all kinds of uh, bad uses of speech. Speech that makes people feel bad. Speech that uh, betrays secrets and so on. Um, I would say there's no theme in this wisdom literature that is more emphasized than the careful, wise use of speech communication. Um, the villains of that piece are the loud mouth, the coarse, the vulgar, the insensitive. We could use some of that. Yes, indeed. <coughs> Chapter 2. My child, when you come to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for testing. So life is going to be a lot of tests. Um, these are moral tests, uh, and you've got to uh, you know, hold to your principles. Verse 5, for gold is tested in the fire, and those found acceptable in the furnace of humiliation. Chapter 3. Listen to me, your father, O children. Act accordingly, that you may be kept in safety. For the Lord honors a father above his children, and he confirms a mother's right over her children. <clears throat> Once again, this emphasis on the family hierarchy. Um, over in 12. My child, help your father in his old age, and do not grieve him as long as he lives, even if his mind fails, be patient with him, because you have all your faculties, do not despise him. 
um, down in 16, and it's all about that, in 16, whoever forsakes a father is like a blasphemer, and whoever angers a mother is cursed by the Lord. So it's all about father until it's almost like an afterthought, uh, getting mother in in the last verse there. Another very strong emphasis in the wisdom literature and the morality of the wisdom literature is care for the poor. Uh, that's true in almost all uh, Jewish literature and certainly in the Torah. But it's very, very prominent here again and again, almsgiving and not cheating, and not taking advantage of the poor and so on. Um, As water extinguishes a blazing fire, so almsgiving atones for sin. Chapter 4, 1. My child, do not cheat the poor of their living, and do not keep needy eyes waiting. Do not grieve the hungry, or anger anyone in need. Do not add to the troubles of the desperate, or delay giving to the needy. Do not reject a suppliant in distress, or turn your face away from the poor. Um, do not avert your eye from the needy, and give no one reason to curse you. For if in bitterness of soul some should curse you, their Creator will hear their prayer. So a very strong emphasis on God is for the poor, and you should be too. It comes back again and again and again. Uh, eight, seven. And dear yourself to the congregation, bow your head low to the great, give a hearing to the poor, and return their greeting politely. And that's an interesting overlap between the concern for the poor and the kind of communication thing. In other words, uh, be nice, <laughs> be a gentle, the lady as the case may be. <coughs> return their greeting politely. Rescue the oppressed from the oppressor, and do not be hesitant in giving a verdict. Be a father to orphans, be like a husband to their mother, and you will then be like a son of the Most High, and he will love you more than does your mother. So this sounds like a very different person from the one who was, uh, you know, beating his child and uh, right. all of that. Um, In 11, we get the personification of wisdom again. Wisdom teaches her children and gives help to those who seek her. Whoever loves her loves life, and those who seek her from early morning are filled with joy. 17, at first she will walk with them on tortuous paths. 18, then she will come straight back to them again and gladden them. So following wisdom will be hard, but it will be successful. <clears throat> 23. Do not refrain from speaking at the proper moment, and do not hide your wisdom. For wisdom becomes known through speech, and education through the words of the tongue. Never speak against the truth, but be ashamed of your ignorance. Do not be ashamed to confess your sins. And do not try to stop the current of a river. Do not subject yourself to a fool or show partiality to a ruler. So there's not that atmosphere of kind of being scared of the political establishment that you will see in other, literature, other wisdom literature. Um, fight to the death for truth and the Lord God will fight for you. So this again, I think, comes as a surprise after the image you form from the domestic uh, conduct thing. Uh, this is calling for a truthful, kind, and brave use of speech. This is the kind of truth to power kind of thing. Do it. And then 30, do not be like a lion in your home or suspicious of your servants. 
five, do not rely on your wealth or say I have enough. Um, I have enough meaning uh, you know, I can do whatever I want because I'm rich enough. Four, do not say I sinned yet what has happened to me. For the Lord is slow to anger. Do not be so confident of forgiveness that you add sin to sin. Eight, do not depend on dishonest wealth or will not benefit you on the day of authority. Eleven, be quick to hear but deliberate in answering. Again, I mean these things are all pretty sound. Fourteen, do not be called double-tongued. And do not lay traps with your tongue. Down in 6.5. Pleasant speech multiplies friends, and a gracious tongue multiplies courtesies. Let those who are friendly with you be many. Now here you get another dimension of this. Um, close association is viewed very warily. In other words, have friends, but be very careful because the world is full of false friends and people who will take advantage of you. Or I'd say almost obsessively. Let those who are friendly with you be many, but let your advisors be one in a thousand. When you gain friends, gain them through testing and do not trust them hastily. For there are friends who are such when it suits them, but they will not stand by you in time of trouble. And there are friends who change into enemies and tell of the quarrel to your disgrace. There are friends who sit at your table, but they will not stand by you in time of trouble. So there is a kind of, you know, keep your distance. Don't get too uh, friendly until you are really, really sure. <laughs> she reminds me once I was, uh, I was teaching in Italy, and uh, teaching at IBM in Italy, and one of the IBM people had been reading uh, American novel and he said in this American novel the mother keeps saying to the kids when they go out in the morning don't talk to strangers and he, he said do mothers in your country say to their children do not talk to strangers I said yeah they do he said well I don't understand if they followed that everyone would always be a stranger <laughs> 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 Okay, so uh, go beat your children. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll continue with Ecclesiasticus next time, and then I think Maccabees. And then what? Maccabees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.